Zing. Hello, thank you very much. I'm Zach Diebold, lead software architect at Cowboy. And today we're going to talk about fitness data. What we're going to cover today, a couple of questions. The first, can an electric bike track your fitness better than a smart watch? And the second is, can an IoT network support thousands of devices sending millions of data points? So, what is Cowboy? Cowboy was founded in 2017 in Brussels, uh, and we build connected electric bikes. You'll see it here beside me. This is the fourth model of the bike. I joined back when it was a tiny startup of about 20 people, uh, and we just had one, one model and a few, a few hundred bikes built. Now we have um, over 30,000 riders. We sell in 11 markets in Europe, and we just launched in the United States. The new Cowboy 4 has integrated wireless charger. In between the handlebars, we call this the cockpit, uh, and charges while you ride. It has over 200 custom parts designed in-house. Um, and this is it here, the Cowboy 4 Sport model and the ST on the screen. So it's a connected bike. What does that mean? It means we can build software features around riding the bike, and it's smart. Part of this is the uh, Cowboy app. This app is your digital companion while you're riding. And we've built many features to improve the experience um, as you use your bike. One of these features is the connected ride. This means that as you're riding, we can give you contextual information about your battery. You use your app to unlock the bike, and we can show you information as you ride. Weather information, you can control your bike from the dashboard, and we have uh, navigation designed specifically for e-bikes, which can even find you the least polluted route to travel through the city. Other features we have are theft alerts. This means you'll always know if your bike moves when you're not around. We can notify your phone. Um, if the bike detects movement, uh, you can track it down with a GPS, and then as you get close and find your bike, you can connect via Bluetooth and, and, and get a connection. With this feature, we've recovered uh, more than 70% of all thefts reported by our customers across all markets. Another feature is crash detection that we offer, which uh, the bike can detect if you, if you have a fall while riding and alert your emergency contacts. You can let them know if you're OK or if you've fallen, uh, and they can track your location live uh, to see if you're OK. So why are we talking about fitness data? We've already discussed um, some of the barriers to entry for electric bikes, which are safety when your bike's uh, parked in the street, safety while you're riding, um, and a connected experience. The vision at Cowboy is to try and reinvent e-bikes for fitness. We want to show customers that riding an e-bike can keep you fit, uh, and you can stay active while riding around the city. We found studies that have shown that uh, e-bikes are fit uh, and keep you active even compared to conventional bikes. This study across seven countries in Europe with 10,000 individuals showed that there was a 51% increase in daily trip distance on an e-bike compared to a conventional bike. Additionally, there was a 9.2% increase in weekly active minutes, uh, taking into account metabolic effort uh, applied by those riders. Some more studies that we found in different markets have shown that customers are even replacing e-bike, um, using their e-bike to replace trips done by a car, uh, up to half of those trips. And additionally, at Cowboy, we want to foster a strong rider community. We already have riders working with us that do test rides 
in, uh, in all of our markets, and we have t cowboy riders um, in 70 cities around Europe that are able to come on a cowboy bike and repair your cowboy. We think that building this community uh, is important for our riders to encourage them to get more fit, and by empowering them with their data and, and fitness information, we think we can make this even stronger. So, what data do we have in the cowboy bike? We have a bunch of different sensors inside the frame that can work together to, to give you that connected experience that I discussed earlier. First, we have the communication module. This is housed inside the bike here, and this has all the radar antennas um, and sensors that we use to communicate outside the bike. For example, this is the GPS that locates you on a map, accelerometer that can understand if the bike moves in relation to gravity, so shaking, a 2G and 4G antenna, which is a SIM card that allows us to communicate with the web straight from the bike, Bluetooth low energy, which allows us to communicate with the mobile app, and temperature and humidity. We also have the cockpit module housed in the front here where this phone is charging, and this is the wireless charger which charges your phone and the battery LEDs indicators. We also have the powertrain system, which is housed between the, between the belt here, the motor, and the pedal crank. This is made up of the battery, which draws power, the torque sensor, which senses your pressure on the pedals, the cadence sensor, which senses the rotation of the pedals, and the motor controller, which tells the motor to give you force. So all these sensors and devices can work together to give us a very good picture about what you're doing on the bike as you're riding. So how do other devices track fitness? How do smartwatches, how does your phone, how do they understand the activity that you're doing um, while, you're, while you're out and about? So I want to ask how many people here have a smartwatch on their wrist or how many people use their phone to track their fitness? If you have your hands up. Yes, and keep your hands up. How many of you understand how they track your activity? Do you understand how it tracks your steps and how it tracks your calories? Some of you have a small idea. Yeah, there's some movement, there's some shaking, there's some GPS. Well, the answer is all of these devices use different ways of calculating your fitness. They have proprietary algorithms and all of them do it a little differently. But it can be it can be reduced down to these uh, key areas um, that are used to calculate fitness. So we have the accelerometer used in all of these devices on your wrist, on your phone, to calculate movement as, as you ride, as you run, as you walk. Also, a heart rate sensor, often on your wrist or on a band, which calculates your heart rate and your exertion um, as you're doing intense activity. Also, elevation for devices that have a GPS inside, which understand as you ascend or descend um, on terrain. And often, biometric data is asked by these applications so that they can build that into their models of height, wage, age, et cetera. All of these put together give you a calories count um, after you've done physical activity. But many of these devices have inaccuracies in the way that they calculate calories. We can see on the first graph above that the heart rate sensor in many of these devices is quite accurate. On the left for cycling, on the right for walking. The margin of error is close to zero in the center. But when we talk about energy expenditure, which is the calories that you've burned, we see a, a huge margin of error uh, for walking and for cycling on many of these devices um, on this study in 2017. Additionally, another study looking at two devices, Fitbit and Garmin, with different intensity activities, high intensity interval training, treadmill, bike, uh, and max intensity, we can see that many of these have a very large margin of error, sometimes close to 100%. So how can we do this better? How can Cowboy track your fitness and track calories better than any of these devices in the industry? The answer is the precise sensors that we have inside the bike can calculate the effort that you apply 
while riding. We have the torque sensor inside the pedal crank here and a cadence sensor to help us understand how much force you put on the pedals. This while riding and matched with speed can give us a very precise uh, value on what you're doing. So let's talk about how we get to that value. The first part we should know about is that human muscular efficiency um, is about 25% when doing an activity such as cycling. A combustion engine in a car, for example, is about 20% efficient at converting energy into useful work. So we're a bit better than that, around 25%. This, this across a number of studies um, over many years, has reached the same value of about 25%, plus or minus a couple of percent, but it's very precise. And there's even been studies showing that there's no difference in cycling efficiency between world-class and recreational cyclists. So this is a very, a very precise number. So let's talk about how we calculate the watts, the, the power that you're applying on the pedals per second. We have the power uh, value is composed of torque and angular velocity. Both of these come from our torque sensor and our cadence sensor. So the torque in Newton meters, each time I press on the pedals, this gives us some torque. And the angular velocity is the rotational speed um, of the pedal crank. So two of these values together um, over one second gives us the power in that one second. So summing that up for the entire trip, gives us an energy value in joules. Joules are just watt seconds, so we can add up these values during the ride, and we get your energy expended in joules on the pedals. So looking at our calories formula that we use, this is composed of E, which is the energy that I talked about, in joules. We have this for the entire trip. We multiply this by the scaling factor from joules to calories. We multiply this by the efficiency, so uh, 1 over 4. And then we divide this by 1,000 to get kilocalories. So putting these four parts together, the joules that you expended during the trip, converted to calories, 25% efficiency, and then um, divide by 1,000 to get kilocalories, we get a precise value for your entire ride on the cowboy bike. We're able to verify um, these measurements using an e-checker device. This is a device um, that we have in our basement at the cowboy office that allows us to apply, to apply pressure on different parts of the bike and simulate a real human riding. So this device can put pressure on the seat, pressure on the pedals, can uh, sense the rotation of, of the rear wheel and the energy put through the battery and through the motor. So the results of our tests, we've been able to apply a continuous torque on the pedals and measure what we read on our sensors. This purple line here shows the torque increasing from the e-checker device, which is the measurement uh, in the e-checker sensors. And then we have our sensors being the blue line following that very closely, which is the derived torque uh, from the bike. Additionally, for the cadence sensor, we can also derive the pedal speed by, by um, using the e-checker sensors on the crank uh, and measuring our speed that our bike is, is returning. And this is the, the two red lines at the top following each other very closely. So this lets us know that our sensors can very well understand what are the outside forces being applied to the bike we can use these in our formulas for calories. So how do we upload all this data? We have data being calculated per second on the bike. We know our sensors are working well. How do we get this to the web, to our customers, so they can see it inside the app? Let's look at the product requirements. As we, as we work as a software company, as a software team, we set requirements for what we need in our customers' products and we follow this up with development. So the first is fitness data for every trip. We want to make sure that every ride, if it's commuting in the morning, if it's a long ride at the weekend, we want all rides to have fitness recorded regardless of the type. 
and the second is upload 25 data points with per second accuracy. We have all these sensors inside the bike. We understand the calories, the power performed by the motor and by the rider. We have the battery percentage of the bike, of the phone. We have all this extra data that we can give to the customer and show them how they ride and what happens during that ride. So with 25 data points, we want to understand how this happened with per second accuracy. That's the second requirement. So what were the challenges with this? This is where we get technical. Maths to software. The four challenges that we had on the technical team were the hardware inside the bike, the reliability of the system and sending data, the scalability of the system, which is ingesting it on the back end, and the data usage of the whole flow. To help you understand the infrastructure that we have, uh, from a technical side, we have the bike and the app connected over a Bluetooth link. This is how the customer unlocks the, unlocks the bike um, and sees live information as they're riding, such as their current speed, their current distance. And we have the bike connected to our backend servers over the web. This is through the SIM chip inside the communication module and uses 2G or 4G to communicate with our backend. So with this infrastructure in mind, let's look at the limits of our hardware. Our hardware was designed only for riding a bike. Um, this was designed by our electronics engineers in-house, and it specifically um, architected to work for riding and for your connected ride. It's not a Raspberry Pi. We don't have Linux running inside there, so we're limited in what we can store inside the bike and the processing power, how many calculations it can do. So the solution we found for this was MQTT. This is a protocol built for low-powered networks, and it helps us to transfer the data out of the bike and to our back end. What we designed is a system where every bike can connect to our central server and stream that data live as the customer is riding. This means we can get all that data off the bike into the cloud while they're riding, and we don't have to store everything um, on the bike. So the bikes connect to uh, what's called a broker, and they publish their data um, with, a, with an active subscription. This is a bit like WebSockets if you have any live um, chat applications running in your browser, there's a live socket open uh, with a server to transfer data uh, two-way. So our bikes are publishing our data to our broker, which is RabbitMQ. Um, this is a message queuing platform that can store the data and receive it over MQTT. And then our backend subscribes to this broker and can pull the data um, into our servers. This is run on Ruby on Rails, and it, it can um, consume the data as fast as we can publish it, and that's the idea. The reason MQTT is very good for this use case is that the per event um, size of the message is very small. We can see even though the size of the um, data to create a connection is very large, this is the blue bar to establish the connection, but as you send more and more messages, the per event size on average becomes much lower when we get to 10 messages and to 1,000 messages. This is compared to HTTP, which still has a very large size per message that, that we send. So we can see the bar in the red in HTTP on the second, fourth, and sixth bar. But this is very large per message, and it doesn't go down um, on average as you send more messages. Additionally, the latency is very lightweight. The transmission time of, of MQTT is very low because we have very small messages that are being sent. You have this active socket open with the back end, and you can stream your messages as fast as you can record them. And so the size of uh, payloads in MQTT remains small compared to HTTP, where the transmission time is very large. So we've solved getting the data off the bike and onto our back end. But the next issue is reliability of this feature. As you can imagine, if you're riding the bike around, you might go through tunnels, you might go through a forest, you might go over a bridge, and this 
comes around with network black spots. And so we have areas of poor network coverage, and this means that we can't have that active stream open to get the data to our backend. This was a real uh, trip done by our from our director, Emmanuel, and um, he was very disappointed because he was missing all this data for 20 minutes as he was riding through tunnels and through a forest. Um, so he was outside Brussels, and um, he could see that the connection was being lost intermittently during that trip. So the solution for this is redundancy via the mobile app. We have this Bluetooth connection active with the mobile app and the bike, and we can use this to help us get more of that data and have a redundant channel that goes via the mobile app and then to the back end. So while the app is active, uh, it can even be in background, but once your Bluetooth is on in your pocket or mounted on the C4 cockpit, we can record that data inside the mobile app. Then the app can transmit that data to the back end, um, scheduled or at the end of the ride, so we, can, so we can conserve the battery power of the mobile app. The battery is very small on the device as compared to our bike, um, where we have many cells um, on the down tube of the bike. So the success of this change meant that we had 12% more data than previously. We could see here from an example um, collected over a day that the data during the beta period uh, was increased by 12% because we had this extra channel. So now that we have a redundant channel coming by the mobile app and we have the bike streaming data to the back end, the next challenge for us was scalability. Our server started to get, to get overloaded with the amount of data that was being ingested. We had data coming from the bikes, streaming live. We had data coming from the apps being sent at the end of the trip. So this amount of data, remember it's per second accuracy and 25 data points per second, this caused a real incident um, uh, over a few days uh, which caused our, our um, DevOps team to investigate. And so over a number of days, um, we struggled with, with acknowledging those messages as fast as those bikes were sending them. You can see these peaks line up with uh, commuting times, the red line being how fast the bikes are sending data, and the blue line being how fast we're receiving it. You can see we couldn't uh, keep up with the load that was being sent by our bikes. And additionally, as the load continues, but we can't take it in fast enough, um, the pending messages in the queue increases exponentially over time. So we had all this data waiting to be processed and our poor beta users couldn't see their live fitness for a couple of days. But it's a beta, so you know they expect that. But so how did we solve this? This was done with moving some of our processing of that data into the background, into scheduled jobs. So if you think about ingesting data the very smallest unit of work you can do is just inserting that one line into the database, all 25 data points. All the other processing that you need to do um, to add more features that we talked about to, to draw the route on a map, to, um, we have a few examples here, to generate uh, your personal records, to generate achievements, uh, to geocode the positions, and to set the route on a map, all of these things can be done later, on a schedule if the, if the data keeps coming in or at the end of the trip. So we, we created these background jobs, and these jobs are put on a queue um, stored in Redis, in an in-memory store, and then processed by Sidekick, a Ruby application that can process um, messages from a queue. And as these are processed, these are put in, into our databases, but this is done at the end of the trip so our servers can free up um, that processing power for, for recording data. And the result of this is our engineers can sleep. We had a very difficult few days trying to solve these incidents um, during our beta period. And after this, we had zero incidents, and we could continue with scaling up. So these are happy messages from our engineers. So then the fourth challenge, um, and the final challenge, but there's always going to be more that come up in, in the future, is data usage. So as we started to transmit all of this data from our bikes 
um, over cellular to the web, we found that the amount of data was increasing exponentially as well as we launched the feature. And so the data costs and the bills keep coming in, and uh, we need to try and target this and reduce that usage. And so you can see here, during a period as well, at the very, very start, when we launched this feature, the usage, started, usage was increasing um, very slowly over a few days. On the left graph, um, which is the data usage, on the right graph, the number of connections um, of our bikes increasing. And so, how did we solve this? We went back to the start of where we defined this feature. We tried to understand what do we really need out of this data. And so, we talked about 25 data points with per second accuracy, but we realized that we were really ingesting too much data, and some of this data doesn't change very often. And so, the solution to this was to upload the fields as they change to the back end. Some of these values, such as um, the vehicle speed, the torque on the, on the pedals, these are changing very fast as you ride, but they're not changing when you're stopped. Some other fields, such as battery state of charge, is only going down every few minutes um, as your percentage goes down on your bike, or assistance mode, or the lights as you turn them on and off on the live dashboard. And so with this, we saw a great reduction in the amount of data that was being sent, but we still achieved our product requirement of per second accuracy on these data points. And so, coming back to our challenges, we had limited hardware inside the bike for all this extra processing, and we solved that by streaming data live to our back end. We solved the reliability of streaming that data to the back end by having a redundant channel over the mobile app. We solved the amount of data that we were processing on both of these channels by scaling back the work being done on the web and pushing that into scheduled jobs. And we solved some of the data usage issues that we had by uh, data usage issues by only uploading fields that have changed, and so reducing the quantity. And so coming back to our questions that we had at the start of the talk, can an electric bike track your fitness better than a smartwatch? We've seen that our, that our algorithm for doing this is, uh, is a standard algorithm for converting work done to, um, to calories. And so with the inaccuracies of all the smartwatch, your Apple Watch is really lying to you. Our bike can do this much better than any other um, fitness trackers. And the second question, can an IoT network support thousands of devices sending millions of data points? We've seen that with some of the challenges we've overcome, we've been able to roll this out from beta to production, and customers right now are getting access to the new application. And so, what were the results of all this? As we're able to deploy this type of feature, we can give much more information to the customer um, inside, their, inside their mobile app. And so we have statistics um, while the customer is riding. We have personal records um, to help the customer compete against themselves. And this video is, is way too much because there's too many features to show, so it's slowing down. We have leaderboards to encourage customers to compete against each other. And we can have these routes uh, mapped out on a map after the trip has been complete. So it's going nice and slow now, but you can see a bit of the um, features I was talking about. The highlights there, moving through to elevation gain that we can track as the customer is riding, and then the trip statistics. And here we have some of these achievements that we talked about here. So, comparing our beta um, users, uh, around 5,000 users, to a control group, both randomly selected, we found that there was an 8% increase in the trip distance done by these riders because of this fitness data that we can offer them. This, along with all the other features, the leaderboards, the personal records, we get all of this extra stuff because of the sensors in the bike, and we can encourage them to do more. We also found a 15% increase in the moving time on these bikes um, across the same group over the same period, meaning that they're, they're moving on their bike more, they're getting more activity compared to users who don't have quite as much insight. 
We also keep getting awesome feedback flowing in from all of our customers, uh, really happy with these type of features and encouraging them to get out and stay active. And finally, if you want to solve hard problems like this, we're hiring at Cowboy in most roles across the organization, not just engineering. So I'd be happy to speak to you after the conference if you're interested to know more. And come and work with us. Thank you very much.